Mornings at 12. The Night Beat starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for staying up late with us tonight. Through the darkness of the opioid epidemic shines a new light in the form of funding. Bear County settled a lawsuit with Walmart for its role in the opioid crisis, and the county ended up with $14 million. Almost two weeks ago, county commissioners approved a plan continuing the use of that money on treatment and prevention. They've already spent $1.5 million expanding an important treatment center. The night team's Camelia Juarez met a local mother who stayed at that center and says the support she's received is helping break a generational cycle. My whole life I wanted to be a mother. Um, I also didn't want to be a mother that left her children because of her addiction. Brittany Kahn is preparing to start a new life after spending the last few months at the Casamia Recovery Home. Kahn says Casamia gave her the support to recover, care for her daughter Isabella, and graduate with her associates this spring. What this place means to me is life because without it is death. Casamia is in this older building with the capacity for 20 women, but a portion of Bear County's funds from its opioid settlement with Walmart will go towards a brand new building with space for 40 women and their children. When we're addressing opioid addiction, opioid overdose, substance abuse, we really have the opportunity to create um, a better existence for their entire family. And Dr. Andrea Guerrero Guajardo with the Bear County Preventative Health Department helped create the policy that will determine how the rest of the county settlement money will be spent. That includes prevention efforts like training pharmacists to review a patient's prescription history to avoid overprescribing. The best way to treat addiction is not to create someone with an addiction in the first place. Recovery is a lifelong journey, so some of the money will go towards helping with employment, affordable housing, violence reduction. Any one of those things can trigger a relapse into addiction again or to, into active using. This for Khan, having a safe place for herself and her daughter opened up doors she never expected to enter. To be able to like feel more comfortable and more confident to be able to do the things like I know I know I know I can do them. But having this foundation like gives me the ability to really be able to do it. The new Casamia building is set to be built this time next year. Camelia Juarez, Case at 12 News. New tonight, a man shot and killed by the owner of a truck he allegedly stole has now been identified as 44-year-old Andrew Herrera. That is according to the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office. We are also learning tonight he died from a gunshot wound to the head. San Antonio police say the owner of the truck was able to track it down using an Apple AirTag device after it was stolen. The truck was tracked to Southwest Military Drive near Goliad Road and I-37. At some point, the owner confronted Herrera leading to the fatal shooting. It's unclear right now if that shooter will be facing any charges. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office has also identified a man shot and killed outside a Northwest sports bar. 36-year-old Daniel Reese died Thursday morning outside Bonehead Sports Pub on Console Drive. That's not far from Wurzbach and I-10. San Antonio police say an argument led up to that shooting. The suspect shot Reese several times before taking off. Reese was pronounced dead at the scene. That suspect later returned, himself, returned to turn himself in and is expected to face murder charges. Our San Antonio Spurs will be well represented at the Hall of Fame in Connecticut this August. Four former players and coaches officially got the call to the hall this afternoon. Super exciting because that includes legendary head coach Greg Popovich, who has led the silver and black for 27 seasons. With more on this big announcement, here's our Andrew Seeley. That's right, guys. This has been a long time coming for Coach Pop. He's the winningest head coach in NBA history and is one of five NBA coaches to win five championships. The Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame Class of 2023 was announced this afternoon at the Final Four in Houston. Pop couldn't make it in person for the ceremony since he's with the Spurs in Sacramento. But he joined ESPN to give his thoughts on receiving this individual honor. It's incredible. Uh, it's obviously an honor, something that one does not think about. Uh, while going through your years uh, in this game. Just think about all the players that I've had the honor to coach who, have, who are the ones who won the games. I sit here uh, amongst people who I've always uh, been in awe of myself. So to be in this situation is uh, kind of an out-of-body experience, to be honest with you. 
Coming up later in sports, we'll also hear from Tony Parker, who is also a member of this class on a reunion with the Big Three in the Hall of Fame. Back to you guys. Thank you, Andrew. We'll look forward to that. The Bear County Sheriff's Office and Crime Stoppers are hoping the public will have some clues that help lead them to a suspect accused of killing a Southwest High School student about a year and a half ago. 18-year-old Anthony Luna was reported missing in September 2021. Three months later, his remains were found by a rancher in West Bear County. Anyone with information in this case asked to call Crime Stoppers. Their number 210-224-7867 or stop. You can remain anonymous with your tips. A man is dead after being hit by a car while walking on the northwest side last night. The crash happened just before 10 p.m. on the west access road of I-10 near De Zavala. San Antonio police say the man was walking in the opposite direction, and when he walked into the left turn, hand, left turn lane, the car hit him and threw him to the ground. He was pronounced dead at the scene. The driver did stop to help and will not be facing any charges. Happening today, the Big Enchilada is back right here in downtown. We're, of course, talking about San Antonio's famous Central Public Library. Today was the reopening after years of renovations. So what can you expect when you stop by next time? A redesign of the main entrance that is more accessible and secure, inclusive restrooms and art walk, more study rooms and classrooms, along with a children's area that includes a new story room, playroom, and space for flexible programming. The $3 million renovations were funded by the 2017-2022 bond programs. The health department shut down a Northwest Side Indian restaurant after an inspection last month. The violations that got their food permit pulled and what the owner said in this week's Behind the Kitchen Door. Plus, a path of death and destruction left behind after a tornado outbreak in the South and Midwest. How state and federal leaders are stepping up to assist those in trouble. Can we just copy and paste this over and over and over and over again? Yeah, well, it doesn't work that way. Well, it should. <laughs> I wish that it did, especially when we had nice days like yeah. today. Yeah, right. absolutely. Because yeah. we've got big changes that move in really into the beginning of next week. We're going to see those temperatures crank up into the 90s. Record challenging warmth possible by Tuesday. And then we'll see another cold front move in into early Wednesday. That will set up a more favorable pattern for some better rain chances. So that is the good news by the second half of next week. So yes, let's kind of go through the big headlines. What we'll be monitoring over the next seven days here in San Antonio. We had the drier air in place today. Hope you were able to soak that up because as we head into the back half of the weekend, we are going to see those south winds turn on. More humidity is going to work its way back into the area. Also is going to be a little warmer out there tomorrow afternoon and breezy as well. We could see some wind gusts upwards of 25 to even 30 miles per hour at times into early next week, especially Monday and Tuesday. Those thermometers look to climb into the 90s, so it is going to be a little taste of summer out there on the horizon. And then late next week, we are expecting cooler conditions to move in, especially if we can find more scattered rain chances that rain cooled air added cloud cover, helping temperatures kind of only top off in the 60s. So more of that temperature roller coaster takes us into next week. But first, a look at current conditions outside right now. 72 degrees, a dew point of 40 officially here in San Antonio this hour. So we still do have relatively drier air in place, especially across our central, western, and northern counties late this Saturday night. But you can see just off to the south, we are starting to see more of that green color color work its way back in. That is more of that Gulf moisture. So while dew points have been on the lower end today, that is going to change through the overnight hours tonight and especially throughout the day tomorrow. Those south winds will pump in more of that Gulf moisture, helping those dew points climb. So I do think you will notice a bit more of that muggy feel out there, especially by tomorrow afternoon. Temperature wise, a little bit warmer tomorrow morning because of that. I think we'll start off in the mid 60s for the most part here in San Antonio across portions of the hill country. A couple of upper 50s not off the table, maybe a little bit warmer the farther south you go starting off in the mid to upper 60s. First thing Sunday morning that cloud cover also will be with us. Maybe a few very isolated showers. We've got a 10 to maybe 20% potential for a stray pop up before the day is done. Low 70s by 11 a.m. as we head into the early afternoon will warm into 
into the low 80s. Mostly cloudy skies, but I do think that could break up just a little bit and lead way to some peaks of sunshine. Temperatures topping off warmer than where we should be for this time of year in the mid to upper 80s here in Bear County across our far southwestern counties. It is possible that we see those thermometers top off in the low 90s already for your Sunday. But then as we head into Monday and Tuesday, yes, the breezy conditions still stick with us there as well. But really check out your temperatures around 93 is that current forecast high on Monday feeling more like summer and then Tuesday we've got a forecast high of 95. Now the record high right now is 93. So if that can verify we could potentially break that existing record. So we'll be keeping eyes on the thermometer pretty closely into Tuesday afternoon. Then we see that next front move in temperatures fall throughout the second half of next week. And yes, the pattern is looking better for some more favorable rain chances. A lot of details to fine tune on that, but good news all things considered because we could definitely use it. Yeah, we could. The copy and paste feature on your clicker clearly is not working. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. I tried. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's going to be a big week in New York City as Donald Trump is expected to make his first court appearance. What we know about the charges he's facing. I don't know, but uh, I am, I'm not here. At the same time, I'm out of country. And don't blame this restaurant owner for the dirty conditions inside his restaurant. He blamed his employees. Why health inspectors shut them down after seeing what was going on behind their kitchen door. Roaches and dirty conditions inside a Northwest Side Indian restaurant gave health inspectors no option but to close them down last month. I dropped by this week to see if they've cleaned up the mess behind their kitchen door. The city located in the 9900 block of Fredericksburg Road was shut down following their February 13th health inspection. Moldy foods in a cooler were condemned and discarded. Household pesticides were found in the kitchen and so were live and dead roaches. Some foods in a cooler were being stored in t-shirt and grocery bags. Raw chicken was stored above ready to eat food in a cooler while several coolers were soiled and needed to be cleaned. So was the stove top in several areas under and behind equipment. The inspector gave them a score of 77. He also suspended their food permit and forced them to close until all the violations were corrected. Hello. The business was back up and running when I stopped by this week. Is there anybody that's like the manager that's here? No, sir. I did come after 12.30. While this worker couldn't answer any questions, the owner arrived as we were leaving. Why, why did you guys get shut down? Yeah, the kitchen uh, cleaning. Okay, it wasn't, yeah. very, it wasn't clean enough for the inspector? Yeah. He says he was out of the country when the inspector came, blaming his employees for letting conditions get out of hand. He says they were only closed about a week while the business was cleaned and pest control services were hired to deal with the roaches. After the inspector coming, uh, he check everything. OK, perfect. You open. Metro health records show the business wasn't reinspected until March 2nd, 17 days after the shutdown order. They were given the green light to reopen once a reinstatement fee was paid and dead insects were removed. One more problem we spotted. The business was displaying an outdated report card with a much higher score, something the owner hopes to earn again next time around. In fact, say, um, after three months, I'm coming, I give you the good number. Okay, well, you should put the, the current one up yeah. so people know. Yes. We'll be watching to see what happens behind the kitchen door. Tim Gerber, KSAT 12 News. Well, the families of two Nashville school shooting victims got to say their final goodbyes. In total, three nine-year-olds and three adults were killed on Monday. Today were the funeral services for nine-year-old Hallie Scruggs and substitute teacher Cindy Peak. Hallie's funeral was held at the same church where her father is lead pastor. Yesterday was the funeral service for another young victim, Evelyn Dickhouse. The community gathered in pink and green to honor her. Two more funerals for the other adults are scheduled for this Tuesday. Former President Donald Trump is expected to travel back to New York Monday ahead of an expected court appearance there on Tuesday. Sources say he's charged with around two dozen counts, including felonies. The indictment by a Manhattan grand jury uh, stems from an alleged $130,000 hush payment payment 
to adult film star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. The district attorney is also reportedly digging into a $150,000 payment to Playboy model Karen McDougal, who claims she was also paid off prior to the 2016 election uh, as part of an alleged uh, affair cover-up. The former president denies both affairs ever happened. Proceed to see a judge at some point, plead not guilty, um, start talking about filing motions, which we will do immediately um, and, and very aggressively. As we wait in New York City, heightened security already ahead of the court proceedings. Members of the NYPD deployed across the city and added protections are in place around the courthouse. Well, the first sentencing has been handed down for one crew member from the set of the film Rust, where cinematographer Helena Hutchins was shot and killed. First assistant director Dave Halls pleading no contest yesterday. A judge gave him six months of unsupervised probation for the negligent discharge of a firearm as part of a plea deal, along with a $500 fine. Hutchins died on the set back in October 2021 when actor Alec Baldwin discharged a gun with a live bullet inside. Halls handed Baldwin the gun. As for Baldwin, he's pleaded not guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Pope Francis is back home after leaving the Rome hospital that he was in this morning where he was being treated for bronchitis. The 86-year-old pontiff spoke to the media as he departed and even had a quick joke that he said, quote, still alive. He also says he was not frightened when he was hospitalized back on Wednesday. The Vatican says the Pope will still preside over Holy Week celebrations, including a Palm Sunday Mass service set for St. Peter's Square. Death and destruction in just a matter of two days. Tornadoes left several states devastated in the South and Midwest. We have the video and the latest on the next incoming storms. One person is dead and at least 28 injured after a roof collapses at the Apollo Theater in Belvedere, Illinois. That's about 70 miles outside of Chicago. Several emergency crews arrived to the scene and worked to rescue people trapped under the debris. About 260 people were inside at the time of the accident. Despite there being no reports of an actual tornado hitting the area, fire crews say the collapse was the result of dangerous storms in the area. And Illinois is just one of nine states hit by massive tornadoes overnight. The death toll rising, reaching at least 22. Tonight, the National Weather Service confirming 31 tornadoes touched down just over two days. The latest just tonight in Delaware. Video captured in Bridgeville in Sussex County, where state police say one person died when a home collapsed during the storm. Friday in Sullivan, Indiana, southwest of Indianapolis, Homes and businesses were destroyed. Drone video shows the path of destruction in Wynn, Arkansas. And at least one EF3 tornado packed winds of up to 165 miles per hour confirmed in nearby Little Rock. People from all of those areas still in shock. By the time I got in there and shut that door, the front window blew out and I just dropped to the floor and crawled under my bed. And, and then that's when the tornado hit. You just hear, you know, all the debris. And I was afraid that that tree was going to fall on us. Governors in Arkansas, Illinois, and Indiana issued a declaration of disaster and emergency. A definitely very scary stuff coming from those strong thunderstorms that impacted such a large portion of the country over the past few days. Thankfully, back here at home, no severe weather. I do wish we would have been able to find a little bit more rain out there. We did find a few showers earlier today, but for the most part, we were on the drier side. A relatively seasonable start as we take a look at the Almanac data. 54 was the low, 87 was the high, 91 in Carrizo Springs, it was 92 in Catula out there earlier this afternoon. We will be stretching for the 90s Monday and Tuesday here in San Antonio, but cooler air and better rain chances move in late week. We'll have all those details coming up in a few. Well, hopefully you enjoyed the beautiful weather that we had across South Central Texas today. For the most part, drier air moved in. Yes, it was a little warm out there this afternoon, but overall a somewhat comfortable start to the weekend. Take a look at this awesome KSAT Connect photo that was sent in from the Pleasanton area this evening. Had a nice little sunset out that way in Atascosa County and also in Atascosa County just after dinner time saw a few isolated showers near Campbellton, Jordanton, even near the Pleasanton 
Wisconsin area there as well. We are pretty quiet out there on the radar late this Saturday night. A little bit of a different story well off to the northeast. That same parent area of low pressure that sparked all of that severe weather that we were just talking about that continues to work its way farther off to the east and closer to the Atlantic Ocean here tonight. But what I want to focus on is actually closer to the west coast. You see this area of low pressure that is actually what's going to drop our next cold front into south central Texas overnight Tuesday and into early Wednesday. That's the time frame that we're looking at right now. Yes, it does look to bring with it some cooler temperatures, but that's also thanks to the higher rain chances that we have in the forecast. That rain cold air combined with the added cloud cover could hold temperatures to the mid 60s by next Thursday and Friday. Much needed rain, better chances and better coverage, especially throughout the second half of next week. And of course, we could definitely use anything that we can muster up out there because you can see this is the latest drought monitor that was released last Thursday. The vast majority of our area in some sort of classification of drought. And unfortunately, we have seen this exceptional drought, this maroon color that has actually expanded a little bit more to include more of Bear County there as well. So we will continue to fine tune those details over the next several days. Definitely worth checking back in on in regards to those better rain chances. All right, temperatures right now tonight, upper 60s, low to mid 70s. Catula, though, is muggy out that way. 80 degrees, 72 in San Antonio this hour, 66 in Kerrville, 73 over in Hondo in Medina County. And yes, already starting to see some of that Gulf moisture work its way back into our southern and southeastern counties. That's going to be the theme that's going to take over as we head into the overnight hours. You can see by tomorrow morning around 7 a.m. More of that muggy feel is returning. Those south winds opening the door for more of that humidity to work its way into the area. So because of that, more cloud cover is expected throughout the day. Also will be a little bit warmer out there in the morning. We're starting off in the 60s. First thing tomorrow here in San Antonio, mid 70s by lunchtime. And then as we head into your Sunday afternoon, mid to upper 80s expected a few low 90s across our southwestern counties. Also will be a little breezy out there for your Palm Sunday. Some wind gusts upwards of 25 to 30 miles per hour. Breezy conditions continue into the first half of next week with those hotter temperatures. 93 by Monday, 95 potentially by Tuesday. But if that's too hot for you for this time of year, we do have that front that will move in along with some cooler weather and those rain chances by late week, guys. It is too hot for me, but it comes with rain afterwards, so it's all worth it. I think that 95 is an April fool. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> all right, Andrew, we heard from uh, Pop being named to the uh, Hall of Fame. Let's hear from Tony, too. That's right. It's nice to finally have Tony Parker in it. Remember the last couple, couple of years we've inducted Tim, we've inducted Manu. Now it's time for the final member of the Spurs Big Three to make his appearance in the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. We'll hear from Tony. Plus, it was moving day in the Valero Texas Open. Got the highlights from that, too. Next. Let's celebrate one more time. You know, I've uh, been to the Hall of Fame the last two years for Timmy and uh, Manu. And uh, this one's, the way I look at it, it may be the, the last time that you can really, you know, celebrate uh, all together. It felt like that for my jersey retirement. And so now we can do it one more time all together. The Spurs Big Three will be reunited one more time in the Hall of Fame in Big Board Sports. Finally, all three core members of the Spurs championship runs in the 2000s will be in the Hall of Fame. Tony Parker was the last one in, joining head coach Greg Popovich in the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame class of 2023. In many ways, this year's class is emblematic of the Spurs dynasty. Pal Gasol spent time with the Spurs, so did assistant coach Becky Hammond. Dirk Nowitzki led some epic battles against San Antonio with the Dallas Mavericks, and so too did Dwayne Wade with the Miami Heat. But there's one word that defines Spurs basketball in the Greg Popovich era, teamwork. Tony knows he didn't get to the Hall of Fame alone. I was very blessed to play in, in great teams uh, with the Spurs, obviously, with the national team. Uh, we won a lot of stuff, and I think it's the main reason uh, I'm here today. Uh, I think uh, kids of today, they, they should always remember that, that uh, we're a team sport, and uh, we should play together, 
and the way we played basketball with the Spurs, it was always like good to great, always trying to find uh, the, the open guy and play together and care for each other. The class of 2023 will get their jackets on August 11th in Uncasville, Connecticut, before holding the enshrinement ceremony the next day in Springfield, Massachusetts. It is moving day at the Bolero Texas Open. Third round action on a gorgeous day at TPC San Antonio. We've got a two-man battle for the lead. Former champ Corey Connors, after a one-over front nine, recovers by scoring five birdies on the back nine, including this one on 15, finishing three under on the round, good enough to sit at 11 under. Just wasn't quite good enough to catch Patrick Rogers yet, who posted a solid one under par. This long putt on 14 set up one of two birdies on the back nine and dropped him to 13 under, but a bogey on 18 meant he heads into the final day with a one-stroke lead. Saturday proved to be Rogers' toughest round yet, but he likes where he sits heading into Sunday. I felt like I drove it really well to put myself in good positions to score. I uh, didn't quite take advantage the way that I had uh, in the, pre the previous rounds. A little sloppy with the wedge play, a little sloppy on the greens, but um, I, know there, I knew there was a long way to go heading into today and just proud of the, being patient and hanging in there and giving myself an, a nice opportunity tomorrow. Here's a quick look at the leaderboard hanging into tomorrow's final round. Rogers leads the way at 12 under with Connor right on his heels, followed by Matt Kuchar in third, Sam Stevens and Chris Kirk both tied for fourth. First tee tomorrow is set for noon. San Antonio FC hits the road to the West Coast to take on Monterey Bay FC and the Alamo City Club strikes first in the eighth minute of play. Connor Maloney with a perfect long ball ahead to Nico Hansen behind the defense and he slots it through the keeper's legs for a 1-0 lead at halftime. Second half now, 85th minute, Zico Bailey rips a shot inside the top left corner. Perfect snipe gives San Antonio the lead for good and they go on to win it 2-1. Our San Antonio Brahmas hit the road to Vegas with a chance to gain some ground in the XFL South, taking on the 1-5 Vipers. And they start fast thanks to a full week of prep with Kurt Benkert starting at quarterback. Opening drive, he finds Fred Brown for the one-yard touchdown and the first points of the game. It's 6-0 Brahmas. Second quarter now, San Antonio trailing 11-6. How about Brown again, this time on special teams, returning the kickoff 96 yards for the only kickoff return touchdown in the XFL this season. Brahmas go up 12-11. Not enough to get the win. They fall 26 to 12 and drop to two and five on the season. Finally, final four tonight. San Diego State defeated Florida Atlantic 72-71 thanks to a buzzer beetle. Excuse me, buzzer beater. UConn knocks off Miami 72-59. So it'll be the Aztecs and Huskies in the national championship game on Monday night. Should be a great atmosphere. I have some friends in San Diego who are losing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so exciting the end of that game. Thanks, Andrew. You got it. Bonus points for sticking around this late. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks for watching and be sure to catch GMSA tomorrow starting at 6. And we will be back here tomorrow. Regular time. Regular time.